Hello guys, Matthew here and welcome back to my channel. I'm here again, yay! Let's just jump into it. We all know that SSDs are fast, but how fast are they exactly compared to each other? When I say that, I'm talking about the different formats they come in, like your classic 2.5 inch SSD or an M.2 SSD, which are nowadays being formed as NVMe M.2 drives with few M.2 SATA models still roaming around. That first type of M.2 SSDs, the NVMe ones, are also using PCI Express lanes for a greater bandwidth gain, which then paired with the up-to-date NAND flash chips and controllers easily surpass performance figures of a 2.5-inch SSD. The thing is that even though a 2.5-inch SATA SSD can carry NAND flash which performance could be similar to those seen on M.2 drives, some even use the same chips, the SATA interface still remains the main problem, or to be more precise, its theoretical bandwidth of just 625 megabytes per second. This is why we are transitioning over to the M.2 format, which in combination with the NVMe protocol and use of PCI Express lanes, can deliver a throughput of up to 16 gigabytes per second in its for now most common 3.0 revision, and that's with full electrical configuration of X16 lanes. This is basically the only mainstream standard which which brings in better bandwidth capabilities in terms of storage, besides the U.2 interface which also uses PCI Express lanes but has a different physical connector and which for now didn't attract that much popularity among manufacturers and mainstream users, since the SATA Express interface flopped big time, never actually lived to see a day except in the form of some ports on Z87, Z97 and even Z170 motherboards. Remember those? Ugh. Unfortunately, the SATA interface is still a go-to choice if you plan to have more than two or three drives, thus limiting your high-performance options, since there is so much space on the motherboard, or the lack of it, which can be reserved for putting an M.2 slot. I hope we will soon see a more concrete alternative that's equally practical as a SATA interface, although, to be honest, the M.2 format as it is doesn't fall behind it, or maybe we will see a greater push for the U.2 standard in the mainstream. Anyways, let's get back on track. The drive which I have today in front of me is Toshiba's new OCZ RC100, which aims to bring in high-end performance of a typical NVMe M.2 SSD to a larger user population with its more affordable price. It's a step in the right direction, one that was expected to happen sooner or later. What's on it hardware-wise, we have a Toshiba's in-house build unnamed controller without any technical details about it, coupled with also Toshiba's 64-layer 3D TLC NAND flash. There's no presence of DRAM on it, as it supports HMB caching technology, which is supported with Windows 10 1709 build and which uses a small portion of your PC's DRAM in order to execute its functions. For the interface, we have an M.2 physical connection combined with the NVMe protocol and PCI Express bandwidth with X2 electrical configuration, which is a bit lower than we are used to seeing on M.2 NVMe SSDs, it's usually X4, but I don't think that will impact the drive's performance, there's enough bandwidth as it is. Since everything is squished inside of a single BGA package, you can see that we don't have a separate controller and NAND flash chips on the PCB itself, which is the reason why they could go lower with its price, but it also resulted in a single-sided M.2 module, which uses a less common 42mm long PCB. This is overall a really compact form factor and it's going to fit well in a notebook for example as an upgrade solution and in addition to that it also supports B plus M key connection so it's versatile in terms of supported M.2 slots but it's also probably the reason why it has a PCI Express X2 electrical configuration. Another restriction which comes from choosing this model and inherently its form factor is its pretty limited maximal storage capacity. Since it's a single-sided M.2 module in question, which is also a shorter 42mm one and not the more usual 80mm one, the RC100 doesn't offer any capacity larger than 480GB since they cannot physically populate it with more NAND flash chips, while mine here is the 240GB one. But then again, it's marked as an entry-level M.2 NVMe SSD, so anything above that probably won't be appealing to users price-wise. That is pretty much it in terms of the more technical side for this model, and beside the 3-year warranty, there's not that much to talk about but to check out its performance. 
putting it through its paces using my usual set of benchmarking tools, you can see that the RC100 indeed delivers well above your average performance compared to a plain 2.5 inch SATA based SSD. It ramps up to 1.6 GB per second of sequential read speed and around 1 GB per second of sequential write speed. Those numbers are actually on point with Toshiba's claimed figures for this model. Besides that, when it comes to other synthetic benchmarks, I was really impressed with its results in the territory of read and write performance and IOPS figures at lower Q depths, being it full or empty, it's even comparable with some high-end NVMe M.2 SSDs, which says a lot about this drive. Putting these synthetic tests on the side, since I've just recently did a review of Kingston's new UV500 model, which is your run-of-the-mill budget representative for the 2.5-inch SATA SSDs, I figured why not compare it with Toshiba's OCZ RC100, as it's also in a way a budget representative of its segment, basically one of the first for its kind, that being a more value-oriented NVMe M.2 SSD model. Obviously, the SATA one trails behind in terms of raw performance output due to its interface limitations, but I'm more interested in seeing the difference in real-life day-to-day user experience. So I've put a fresh copy of Windows 10 on the RC100, all nice and tidy, updated everything, filled it up pretty good with games and other software, almost to the top, and I was good to go. Looking at the numbers and stopwatch figures in terms of Windows boot time and loading games, there was little to none difference between the 2.5 inch SATA SSD and this M.2 NVMe SSD. As you can see, it basically boils down to a measuring error. Booting to Windows was in both cases done in around 10 seconds, and measuring loading times of three different games resulted in a pretty dead even race, as shown here. The only substantial difference between them can be seen during, for example, your plain file transferring, but that's not your ordinary user case scenario, seeing someone transferring files from one folder to another on a daily basis, and that is if you even have another high-end NVMe SSD to transfer to or from, because otherwise you'll have a bottleneck, while the next tangible and really applicable difference can be seen in content creation suits, like the Premiere Pro or After Effects, where the difference between these two drives grows apart when it comes to loading or scrubbing footage. I could say that I've expected a turnout like this one when comparing these two interfaces and formats, since SSDs are pretty straightforward products. They store your data and have a certain level of performance, and that's pretty much it, so with picking up an SSD from a budget, mainstream or even from the prosumer segment, you'll basically get the same result when we talk about your user experience in a standard PC setup. Except maybe for the difference in the warranty length, or if for example some model or brand has a really bad reputation in terms of being reliable, there is hardly a reason to go for a drive that has a price premium on it, even though it brings in better raw performance. 
Yes, there are some scenarios and users who can benefit from it, but majority of us will be more than happy with a more value-oriented 2.5-inch SATA SSD model, or just one with a greater capacity as opposed to getting a similarly priced higher-performing drive. In the end, now that everything is laid out, you can decide what you will get, because you are the one who knows what are your precise needs in terms of how you use your PC. That's it for this time from me. Thank you for watching. Feel free to toss me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. That really helps me a lot. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't. And if you already are, be sure to press that notification bell down below so you don't miss out on a new video. And until then, catch you later, guys.